She was a sister of the last empress, a wife of Governor General of Moscow, a monastery abbess, a white angel, a saint. Nowadays, the image of Elizabeth has transformed in our minds into something perfect, something immaculate, and sweet. But she was happily married. She was a Grand Duchess, the First Lady of Moscow. Grand Duchess Elizabeth Theodorovna is the most enigmatic figure of the House of Romanov. Her political power was surrounded by legends. If it went so far as to replace a Minister of Home Affairs, the extent of that power is easy to guess. The Empress' sister openly opposed Rasputin. She was considered one of the parties involved in the plot against him. She saw Grigory Rasputin's true face, which was plain and simple. Answers to many questions could have been found in her diaries and letters, but they mysteriously disappeared. In KGB archive documents, it is often stated that the sisters hid the papers. A century after the Grand Duchess' death, the archives reveal documents that have never been seen before. It turns out that officers of Tsar's secret police were watching her around the clock for seven years. An explosion occurred on a special train of Grand Duchess Elizabeth while it was moving. There was an attempt on her life, and her husband, Grand Duke Sergei Alexandrovich of Russia, brother of Emperor Alexander III, became the first Romanov to be assassinated by terrorists in the 20th century. When she saw the remains of her husband, she began to pick them up with her own hands. His death was something that changed her life once and for all. Palaces and splendor were left in the past. Her new life was all about praying and love. A lot of people think that this is an overly heavy cross to bear, and that I would either regret and get rid of it, or collapse under its weight. When Elizabeth came up with the idea to set up a cross, on the spot where Sergei Alexandrovich died, she called it a cross of forgiveness, because there is a remarkable inscription on that cross. Those words are taken from the Gospel. They belong to the Savior. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That cross, was the first monument of the Moscow Kremlin to be destroyed, after the October Revolution. Lenin, under the chairmanship of the People's Commissariat, and accompanied by allies and enthusiasts, that included poet Mayakovsky and many others, took a rope, and easily toppled the colossal seven-meter-high cross, making it fall to the Tainitsky Garden. The monument disappeared, seemingly forever. A hundred years later, in May 2017, the cross was recreated in accordance to sketches by Vasnetsov, and it came back to the spot where Elizabeth Theodorovna had set it up. Она не покинула страну в годы самых тяжелых испытаний и до конца своих дней сохранила верность идеалам христианского всепрощения и любви. It was a terrible blow to Elizabeth, a 40-year-old young and energetic woman, as she couldn't imagine her life without her husband. They had been happily married for 20 years, and it had been a strong wholesome marriage, that used to be the center of her universe. He used to manage all the things on his own, and also guided me in everything. I truly was weaker. His heart was the most faithful, unchangeable and pure, among those I have ever known. I wish someday I will be found worthy of having been his wife. He was 47 years old when he got assassinated. 
He died as the acting head of the Moscow military district, which is to say, he was the military head of all central Russia. And when riots started to erupt in 1905, causing confusion among Moscow authorities, it was the Grand Duke who ordered to bring the military in. That helped to ease tensions fast and without bloodshed. His firm position in this situation was obviously an unwanted obstacle for socialists and terrorists. The Grand Duke really disliked taking precautions on his own. He hid from everyone all the threatening letters he received, never showed them to anyone, and destroyed them. Only once did he let it slip out, when I was reporting to him on security measures around the palace. That is written in the memories of Junkovsky, an adjutant of the Grand Duke. Sergei Alexandrovich moved around Moscow unguarded, as he did that morning, on the 4th of February, 1905. We are standing on the very heart of the Kremlin, the Ivanovsky Square. That is the last place connected to Grand Duke Sergei. The Grand Duke came out of the small Nicholas Palace and got into a carriage. Then the carriage went around the palace and along the Ivanovsky Square to the Kremlin Senate and passed it. At around 20 meters from the St. Nicholas Tower, a Socialist Revolutionary Party member stood in the way of the carriage. At that moment, Elizabeth was at a warehouse of medical supplies and donations to soldiers of the Russo-Japanese War. She worked at that warehouse day and night. Three months before her husband was assassinated, she had written a letter to Princess Yusupova. It had said, we live on a summit of a volcano, which is going to erupt. When it does, who will be affected? I have never thought we would have to live in such a horrible, anxious time. Lord, have mercy upon us. We are standing at the place where Grand Duke Sergei was the first to fall victim of the revolution of 1905. An explosion happened at 2.47 p.m. Everyone who happened to be in the Kremlin at the moment was shocked by the sight of a column of fire and ash and shattered glass. All people rushed to the spot. The explosion was massive, tremendous. Elizabeth turned pale, screamed this is Serge, and she ran outside, wearing almost no proper clothing at all. She was the first one to cover that short distance and come to the spot where Sergei was assassinated. She started to pick up some little pieces, cloth rugs, remains of her husband, saying, Sergei didn't like a mess. Some unknown woman put a white shawl on the widow's head. Somebody brought a stretcher, originally meant for soldiers. She covered the remains with a grenadier's greatcoat that somebody gave her. Then the procession went to the Alexeyevskaya church of the Chudov monastery. The first memorial service was held at the relics of Saint Alexius, who was much venerated by Grand Duke Sergei and loved by Grand Duchess Elizabeth. The Novospassky Monastery. Next to the body of Grand Duke Sergei Alexandrovich, one may find his belongings, that were taken out of his coffin during the reburial. Among those things, there is a wedding tablecloth. There are numbers embroidered on that tablecloth. 3.6. And an 1884, just below. That means that the 3rd of June 1884, their wedding date. All the things Elizabeth had found at the site of her husband's death, she wrapped in that tablecloth. She put her wedding ring to his coffin too, just next to his own ring, disfigured by the explosion. 
She did that as a sign that they will always be together, that she will always be with him. That was a ring with his name engraved on it and the date of their wedding. They were distant relatives. The mother of Sergei, Maria Alexandrovna, belonged to the house of Hesse Darmstadt, like Elizabeth. Darmstadt, Germany. Elizabeth was born in this city on the 1st of November, 1864. Her parents were Ludwig IV, Grand Duke of Hessen by Rhine, and Princess Alice, daughter of Queen Victoria of England. The baby girl was called Ella, by all family members. Alice wrote to her husband, Ella constantly kisses me, and wraps her chubby little hands around my neck. She makes a scene every time I have to leave. She is so gentle. Sweet plump Ella is very strong, and far from being quiet. Photo albums of Dukes and Duchesses of Hesse are kept in Darmstadt archives. The photos show palaces and houses where Ella's family lived back then. There were seven children in the family. Ella's brother later recalled. Every Saturday morning, we were supposed to bring bouquets of flowers to the hospital, and present them to different patients. Even the smallest ones among us, had to accompany our mother during these visits. Her mother always said that princes and princesses, need to receive the same upbringing ordinary kids do. Or even a stricter one. Because the more advantage you get, the more responsibility you have to bear. Elizabeth's mother died of diphtheria at the age of 35. But that time was enough for her to bring two Russian Orthodox saints to the world. Frankfurt, December, 2017. We see preparations for an international exhibition opening. It was called, Princesses of Hesse in Russian History, and it was made possible, only because of the educational society named after Elizabeth and Sergei. Unique pieces were brought there, from all around the world. The biggest museums of Russia, the Hermitage, the Trechukov Gallery, the State Historical Museum, contributed to this exhibition. But there were also some museums that helped us and which we had never heard of before, like a museum in Jordanville, America. The House of Hesse, also provided an object of great rarity, a family album. Heroines of the exhibition can be found on its pages. A unique photo, 1864, Alice, Grand Duchess of Hesse, is expecting a baby. Ella will be born in several months. A guest of the house is a relative, Maria Alexandrovna, Empress of Russia. She arrived with her son, Sergei, who is not in the picture. Princess Alice and Maria Alexandrovna often visited each other. It is worth mentioning that the Empress had a kind heart. She didn't abandon the girls of Hesse, after their mother had died. Maria Alexandrovna had a soft spot for Elizabeth. It is very possible that Sergei remembered this fact, and took it into account later, when choosing a wife. In November 1883, Ella agreed to become Sergei's wife. Sergei told the news to his brother the Emperor, unsure if he deserved that much happiness. His feelings are understandable. At that time, people used to say that there were two exceptional beauties, both called Elizabeth, Elizabeth of Austria, and Elizabeth of Hesse. Maria Pavlovna, a niece of the Grand Duke, wrote in her memoirs, Aunt Ella is one of the most beautiful women I have ever seen in my life. She is a tall and delicate blonde, she has very clean-cut features, and grey-blue eyes. There is a little brown patch in one of her eyes, and that adds even more charm. Ella's grandmother, Queen Victoria, gave her consent for the marriage only after British special services, had ran a thorough background check on the groom. Their verdict was suitable for marriage. A bit too reserved, and extremely religious. He attends church more often than necessary. That was the flaw they had found in Grand Duke Sergei. On New Year's Eve, 2018, 
German newspapers wrote about the success of the Russian exhibition, dedicated to four princesses of the House of Hesse. A representative of the House of Romanov, a great-great-grandson of Alexander III, specially arrived in Germany to see the exhibition. We are now standing at the exhibition, dedicated to four German princesses. They were a part of Russian history. Their lives were complex. It's difficult to say whose fate has impressed me most. Paul's great-grandmother, Empress Maria Alexandrovna, was deeply affected by her husband's infidelity. Grand Duchess Natalia Oleksevna, died while giving birth. The tragic fates of the last Empress and her sister, are well known. Despite all the splendor and exceptional beauty of many pieces at that exhibition, I am most impressed by this museum complex, which provokes feelings of piety, immense tenderness and pity. This earring was found in 1919, at the site of the imperial family's first burial. Next to the earring, one may see a portrait of young Alice. It's a watercolor painting, drawn by Grand Duchess Elizabeth, and it depicts her sister, the future Empress Alexandra, wearing those very pearl earrings. One of them was later found when sifting the ground at Ganina Yama. The relationship between the two sisters, older and younger, Elizabeth and Alexandra, was very close and strong. They were quite little when their mother passed away, and that was a significant event for them. They were there for each other, and they supported each other strongly. The very fact of Sergei and Elizabeth taking part in arranging the marriage between Nicholas and Alexandra cannot be underestimated. It's safe to say that their word was decisive. Alexander III died in 1894. Russia got a new ruler, Nicholas II. Before he died, his father had given his blessing to Nicholas, to choose as his wife the woman he loved, and thus, an intricate crown for Alice operation, that lasted many years, ended successfully. The documents prove, that the marriage between the heir to the throne and Princess Alex, was arranged with the direct participation of Grand Duke Sergei and Grand Duchess Elizabeth. There were four parties to this secret alliance. Nicholas, Alex, Sergei, and Elizabeth. That private club members had different names. For example, letters were coded as Paley 1 or Paley 2, and they went through Elizabeth. Here is one of the letters, written inside this secret alliance. Elizabeth Fyodorovna, wrote to the future emperor, My dear Nikki, Paley's love is still strong and deep. The thing is that she can't change her religion. She feels it is a wrong thing to do. Nonetheless, I still hope I'll manage to convince her to do as she should. After all, love is sacred as well, one of the purest feelings in this world. Alex was Queen Victoria's beloved granddaughter. The Queen always called her Sunny, and didn't want to part with her and see her leave for the far away, restless Russia. The Queen wrote to Elizabeth, Dear Ella, I've heard rumors that someone is taking a very active part in promoting this marriage. Do you happen to know who might that be? To which Elizabeth responded, Of course not dear Grandma, if I knew that, I would immediately let you know. In the autumn of 1893, Nicholas was supposed to leave for Darmstadt, to ask for Alex's hand. The trip was cancelled, with the interference of his mother, Empress Maria Fyodorovna. Grand Duke Sergei Alexandrovich, sent an angry letter to his nephew. Dear Nicky, you either happen to have no character and will, or your feelings have completely changed. In this case, it is deeply regrettable that you haven't told that straight to my wife, or me. We can understand the heir's parents' point. It was known that Alex, Princess of Hesse, most likely was carrying the gene for haemophilia. 
As we know, the gene of the awful disease, hemophilia, was spread among the descendants of the queen. It was passed on through the female line. Historians ask strange questions like, how did they let it happen, if they knew there was a possibility of children being born sick, and so on. I think these discussions, shouldn't take place at all. There was love, it was big and strong. Elizabeth and Sergei, just supported the thing that was destined to happen. That was all. The first time Princess Alex, saw Cesarevich Nicholas, her future husband, was at her older sister's wedding, another thread that forever connected these two couples. The bride of Grand Duke Sergei, was 19 years old. She was taken to Russia on a train, decorated with her favorite white flowers. An adoring crowd met it at every station. Elizabeth was astonished by the fact that she was taken to the Winter Palace, in an 18th century gilded carriage. For several days there was incessant bell ringing, as a part of the wedding celebrations. We're looking at the manifesto by Alexander III, informing that a wedding between his brother, Grand Duke Sergei, and the Princess of Hesse, has taken place. We command, that the wife of Grand Duke Sergei Alexandrovich be called, Grand Duchess Elizabeth Fyodorovna, with the title of Her Imperial Highness. Why the patronymic name was Fyodorovna? That is because centuries before that day, Alexander Nevsky carried the Fyodorovskaya icon of the Mother of God with him, which he received from his father. That icon was used when baptizing all the Russian empresses, who adopted Orthodox Christianity. The Grand Duke's wife wasn't an empress, so she wasn't obliged to adopt Orthodox Christianity. Emperor Alexander III, wrote to his brother. I know how much the thought that your wife doesn't belong to our church burdens you, but I still haven't lost hope, that this cherished dream of mine will come true. And that it will happen to your dear Ella. Elizabeth Fyodorovna, will become orthodox. But that will take years. She was pondering over it for seven years. She took lots of actions connected with Orthodox Christianity, and became more Orthodox than many people, who already belonged to this religion. The key role in her adopting Orthodox Christianity, belonged to her husband. Grand Duchess Elizabeth was a Lutheran when she came to Russia. Gradually, with the Grand Duke's model in front of her eyes, his strong faith and veneration of the saints, inspired interest in her. She felt like reading the catechism together with him. Her decision to adopt the Orthodox religion was a shock to her relatives. Your letter caused me a lot of pain, Grand Duke Ludwig IV wrote to his daughter. She replied to that. My conscience doesn't let me keep living as I did. That would be a sin. I have been lying to everyone, trying to stick to my former religion. It is impossible to live the same way anymore. When Elizabeth told Sergei about her decision, he was on the verge of tears. Then she said, that belonging to the same religion with one's husband, is great happiness. Elizabeth Fyodorovna, adopted Orthodox Christianity, a week before Easter, on Lazarus Saturday, 13th of April, 1891. The voice of the Grand Duchess, who was reading the Creed, was confident and calm. She was wonderful as an angel, wearing a white dress, barefooted, her hair down. That decision, was going to change Elizabeth Theodorovna's life, more than she, or her family members, could ever imagine. Emperor Alexander III, presented an icon of the Savior to her, to commemorate her adopting the Orthodox religion. With this icon against her chest, 
She later stepped towards the shaft, where her life on earth ended. Elizabeth was deeply religious throughout her life. At the same time, in her letter she often stressed out that she wasn't fanatical, she just had faith from the bottom of her heart. And she didn't just say that, she proved that with her actions. The thing that Elizabeth Fyodorovna did after her husband's death, stunned all of Moscow. She went to prison to see his assassin. Kind and religious, Grand Duchess Elizabeth Fyodorovna, brought a small cross for him. She talked to him and forgave him. She is a saint. She never revealed what they talked about, she only said that as she entered, he asked, Who are you? I am the wife of the person you killed. She forgave him, and presented him with a scapula. Ella is a saint, she is majestic in her grief. There's evidence that the assassin told Elizabeth that he had seen her in the carriage with her husband plenty of times before, and hadn't had the heart to throw a bomb. So she should have been grateful that he had saved her life. To that, she answered, Don't you understand that by killing my husband you have also killed me? There was another person, whom the Grand Duchess visited some hours after the explosion. The Grand Duke's coachman was suffering from multiple injuries. He was promptly taken to the hospital. Knowing that Andre Rudinkin was dying, she came to him in a white dress, so that he wouldn't see her mourning. And she told him that it was the Grand Duke himself, who asked her to pay a visit, as if he was alive. Andre Rudinkin died in peace. She spent the first days after her husband's death by his coffin, almost never leaving. And during those hard days, during memorial services and burial, unfortunately neither Emperor Nicholas II nor Empress Alexandra could be there by her side. They didn't come to Sergei's funeral, because there was a revolutionary situation, and coming there could have possibly resulted in the death of the imperial family. Elizabeth herself begged them not to come. Alex naturally wants to go, same as Mama, but they were persuaded not to do that as it is too risky. However, it is awful to leave poor Ella alone. She survived the tragedy with great fortitude, but of course there were very tough moments for her. It's known that several times she went roaming the streets of Moscow unguarded in the evening or even at night, which was uncharacteristic of her. The shock she felt was incredible. Answers to many questions could have been found in her diaries and letters, but they mysteriously disappeared. We don't know a single line from there. She didn't want other people to read them, and we think that Elizabeth destroyed all of them. This is her first will, we know of, the one she wrote after her husband's death. All the photos should be burned, they only hurt even more. All the clothes I gave to my maids, I kept only my morning gown, and it will also go to them. There is a curious and mysterious line in the will, I want my old bag to be destroyed with everything that is inside it. Don't open it. Her life was split before and after her husband's death. She was two different people in these parts, with different preferences. She used to write in letters after Sergei's death, there was everything in my life. I saw glamour and lights. I know all of that. I had all of that, and that is not what I want. After her spouse's death, she literally dedicated her life to perpetuating the memory of him. A cross, made according to Vasnetsov's sketches, a church called Comfort and Consolation, dedicated to the Grand Duke and all the victims of political terror. She organized almost 45,000 funeral dinners for the poor people of Moscow. The widow initiated memorial services in different churches that lasted for many years. Some of them continue up to this day. In the Alexandrovsky Metikian, in Jerusalem, the Grand Duke's name is still mentioned in prayers every day.
There is a remarkable thing that few people know about. There is a nun who is reading the Psalter for Grand Duke Sergei, and this process has been ongoing since 1905. The reading of the Psalter doesn't stop for a single moment. Nuns alternate with each other and keep reading. That was her desire, and so it goes on and on. Nineteen o three, the imperial family walks from the Grand Kremlin Palace to the Assumption Cathedral. This is the only footage where Elizabeth Fyodorovna can be seen in a formal dress. There she is, following the imperial couple, holding her husband by the arm. These days, Grand Duke Sergei Alexandrovich is either overshadowed by his wife or mentioned as an unpleasant, wicked man. His image has been distorted and defamed for a very long time. This perception was created largely because of the memoirs of Grand Duke Alexander Mikhailovich. In these memoirs, Sergei is presented as a naval officer with quite loose morals. However, it is only natural that Sergei was a certain source of irritation for Alexander. I would give 10 years of my life to prevent her from becoming a wife of that arrogant Sergei. He didn't hide it and wrote that he envied Sergei. Many people were in love with Elizabeth, so he couldn't understand why did she choose him and not me. In 1891, Emperor Alexander III appointed his younger brother Grand Duke Sergei as the Governor General of Moscow. Sergei and Elizabeth had mixed feelings about that, as their previous life in St. Petersburg was free of such heavy responsibility. After seven long years of happy marriage, we're supposed to start a completely new life. We're going to play the role of a reigning prince, which is extremely difficult for us. That is because instead of playing this kind of role, we would rather have a quiet family life. Tverskaya Street, 13. Nowadays, this building in the city center is occupied by the government of Moscow. Starting from the late 19th century, that place was home to governors general. All the official receptions, the entire life of the couple, including representational activities and diplomatic receptions, mainly took place here. At the time when the couple moved in, the palace had already been a hundred years old. It required considerable changes. Nikolai Sultanov, a famous architect, was invited to take charge of the renovations. Thanks to students of Stroganov State Academy, we still can see watercolor pictures in the State Historical Museum and we can imagine what the interiors look like. This room is decorated with a bright style of Art Nouveau. This is the bathroom of Grand Duke Sergei. We can see a lot of paintings. This winding staircase led to his and Elizabeth's bedchamber. Throughout the 20 years of their marriage, they shared a bedchamber, which was unusual back then. At the same time, each of them had their own part of the palace. Elizabeth spent a lot of time in her study. When guests entered the ballroom of the palace, they were greeted by a portrait of the First Lady of Moscow. The main decoration of the room was a portrait of Grand Duchess Elizabeth, painted by Wilhelm von Korbach. It was commissioned by the Grand Duke, and he thought it was one of the best pieces. Receiving an invitation to attend a ball at the Palace of the Governor-General was a fabulous gift. There are memories of a 1904 ball debutante, Natalia Baluova. She was greatly impressed by the mirrored staircase, of which we can still see remains in the palace. And we can still imagine what an astonishing look beautiful Elizabeth had when standing at the top of that staircase. She was incredibly good-looking, wearing a pale pink dress, a diadem, and a massive ruby necklace. We looked at Elizabeth in admiration and marveled at her amazing complexion, her fair skin, and her elegant attire, the design of which was drawn personally by her. One year later, the Grand Duke was assassinated by a terrorist. Elizabeth Fyodorovna had to see the palace getting devastated during the October Revolution. 
Everything was destroyed, private apartments, luxurious halls, studies, and an exceptionally beautiful home church, dedicated to Saint Sergius of Radonas, and Saint Alexander Nevsky. The spouses used to pray there every day, hidden away from the world. Contrary to popular belief, they were happily married, but he was the head of the house and had full control over everything. Ella fully supported that, and he treated her with great care and gentleness. They both really loved children. Sadly, they didn't have any of their own. Probably we are not destined to enjoy absolute happiness. If I had children, I guess this planet would be a paradise for me. But this is a thing that God does not want. The Lord moves in a mysterious way. Why Grand Duke Sergei and Grand Duchess Elizabeth did not have children? Many people are curious to know, but they became parents to a huge number of children because the Grand Duchess was the head of the Elizabeth Charitable Society, which existed in Moscow for more than 25 years and took care of 9,000 newborns. Shelters founded by the Grand Duchess didn't have much in common with regular orphanages. This is a child's dress, decorated with lace and pleats. This is a dress made for girls with true love, as if they were someone's own children. The same goes for all the rest of the garments that were brought here for orphans. This dress was surely approved by the Grand Duchess personally. Grand Duke Sergei wrote to his brother the Emperor, together with my wife, we visited the educational home today. I have heavy feelings. While we were there, we saw a two days old boy getting admitted, weighed, washed, and handed to a wet nurse. It was a lovely boy, with big black eyes. I had a strong desire to hold him. This house is more than a hundred years old. It was built in 1892. The wooden walls can still breathe. This building used to be a maternity shelter. It was built in Ilyinskoy Manor House, by Grand Duke Sergei. A childless Grand Duke, building a maternity hospital, was quite a bizarre thing at the time. People thought, that the reason was a shock he had to go through. Grand Duchess Alexandra Georgievna, the Grand Duke's sister-in-law, died in the autumn, in the Ilyinskoy Manor House, during childbirth. She got married to Grand Duke Paul the last son of Emperor Alexander II. That place was a little piece of heaven, loved by everyone, be it Elizabeth and Sergei, or Paul and Alexandra. There are beautiful pictures of pregnant Alexandra, sweet and plump, a charming photo that symbolizes youth. Elizabeth and Alexandra became close friends. The sudden death of the young Duchess, who was just 21, came like a thunderbolt, and it seemed that everyone forgot about the newborn baby. That is what his sister Maria, wrote in her memoirs. At the time, neonatal intensive care units for premature babies were a very rare thing. That's why the baby was wrapped in cotton wool and put in a cradle filled with hot water bottles to warm it up. Uncle Sergei personally washed him. Following doctors' recommendations, the child was getting stronger and gaining weight. The child was called Dmitri. His father left Ilyinsko after the stress. Sergei didn't blame him. My dear Tsip. This is a nickname family members gave to Paul. For everything we suffered and went through together, you can be confident that I'm ready to give my life for your children. In fact, Dmitri and Maria were raised by their uncle and aunt. That happened because their father got married for the second time, beneath his station. Actually, he deluded Emperor Nicholas II, and perhaps that's why he was punished so much, because he promised not to marry again. One of the consequences of the Grand Duke's death was that his wife Elizabeth became the person to bear responsibility for these children. Nobody saw Elizabeth Fyodorovna crying, apart from her niece and nephew, Maria and Dmitri. The Grand Duchess had a sleepless night in the nursery, right after the explosion day. The widow wrote to their father that from that moment on, she became the head of the family. 
You know that for me. Your precious little darlings are like angels, that with their kind and tender little hearts, will help me keep living for them. The only person who was the meaning of my life before, worthy of my heart and soul, was Sergei. The Martha and Mary Convent of Mercy, was Elizabeth Theodorovna's major creation. After her husband's death, she sold her jewelry, and bought several houses on Bolshaya or Dinka Street, in Moscow, and started building a church. Her retreat into the Martha and Mary convent, wasn't approved by the imperial family, even by the closest people. Nobody was present at the taking of her vows, apart from her sister Victoria and a couple of close friends. The Grand Duchess wrote to Nicholas, just before her tonsure. Now it feels I'm saying goodbye to the past, to former mistakes and sins, in the hope of reaching a higher purpose and a finer life. Pray for me my dear. I'm going to take vows that are much more serious than those a young girl takes at her wedding. She founded the Martha and Mary convent, which wasn't a nunnery in the literal sense. Moreover, she wore a white monastic cassock for the rest of her life, but that wasn't a monastic cassock in the literal sense either. Mikhail Nesterov, Elizabeth's favorite artist, painted the frescoes in the church of the convent. He also designed the monastic garments of the sisters. The first garments were created by a popular dressmaker, from Rue de la Paix, in Paris, which dressed some royal houses. And that was the only point that Elizabeth gave in, regarding her care of how she looked. Elizabeth's idea, of combining social work and serving God, was revolutionary for the time. She combined a hospital and a church, in one. At the convent, she opened a pharmacy, a shelter for girls, a dispensary, and a hospital. It was believed that Grand Duchess Elizabeth's hospital, was the best one in Moscow. There were sisters who despite their social status and rank, eagerly learned medicine, and together with all the other sisters, took part in dressing changes and operations. Many young women decided to become sisters of the convent. It was possible to leave the convent, if for example a girl found love. She could get married and leave, but she was leaving with a range of acquired skills. She knew medicine, housekeeping, prayers. Those girls were already moral and mature personalities, who were professionally trained in addition. The convent was founded in 1909, and quickly gained popularity. People with various needs, started to come to the Great Mother, as they called Elizabeth. Back then, a lot of girls suffered from unrequited love. The convent sisters even had to seek those poor ones at railway stations. The convent received letters, informing them that a certain lady left a certain place, and those who wrote the letters begged the sisters to find the missing girl, because there was a possibility she would throw herself under a train or hurt herself in other ways. Those girls were usually passionate, and Elizabeth used to have a whole squad of assistants, who watched the stations, brought the girls to the convent, and calmed them down. Elizabeth found the time to do everything. She attended the services in the convent church, settled a lot of organizational issues, and worked at the hospital. She slept on a wooden bed without a mattress, and on a hard pillow. It often appeared that she only had some two or three hours left for sleep. Once, there was a woman who had knocked a burning kerosene lamp on herself. Her body was one big injury, gangrene set in. The Grand Duchess started treatment. She was patient, and unyielding. The patient recovered in several weeks. Her recovery, was considered a miracle. Nicholas II's abdication, in March 1917, turned out to be a terrible blow to her. The institution in which she so strongly believed, fell apart. The Grand Duchess was removed from running all the charity activities, some of which she had been supervising for 25 years. The only thing she wasn't deprived of, was the convent. No. 
I still can't understand how this person found strength not to be broken, to bear both superhuman physical exertion and the absence of any activity at all in 1917. I was stunned to see how sick and exhausted she looked. This woman, who used to never stay put, was now spending most of her days embroidering or sewing in a wicker chair. This was written in the memoirs of Grand Duchess Maria Pavlovna, on the last time she saw her aunt. The Kaiser, repeatedly offered her to go to Prussia, with the help of the Swedish ambassador, because there was a great deal of turmoil in store for Russia. But the Duchess replied to him, that she would not willingly leave neither the convent, nor Russia. Grand Duchess Elizabeth Fyodorovna, the abbess of the Martha and Mary convent, was arrested on the 7th of May, 1918, the third day of Easter. There were Christ is risen cheers everywhere, and Patriarch Tikhon came to visit the convent. He led the prayer service and talked with the sisters. And then as he left, a group of Red Army soldiers came to the convent. She became one of the last Romanovs, to be arrested by the Bolsheviks. At the same time, the family of Nicholas II, had already been deported to Yekaterinburg. The Bolsheviks hesitated for a long time to arrest Elizabeth, because she was greatly respected for her works of mercy. They were scared to send Russian members of the Red Army after her, because she was incredibly popular among soldiers of Moscow, so they sent Latvian riflemen to arrest her. They gave Elizabeth just half an hour to collect her belongings. Today, a glove that she dropped when exiting the gates, is cherished by the Martha and Mary convent, as a holy relic. The parting was very painful. The sisters were crying, screaming. They were ready to go lie under the car, they were running after it along the street and screaming, we won't give away our mother. The sight was heartbreaking. They were going to lose everything at that moment. Two sisters of the convent, Varvara and Ekaterina, got into the car together with the abbess. A train was waiting for them, at the Yaroslavl railway station. Just before she got arrested, she had written to her sister Victoria, the Lord acts in a mysterious way. The fact that we can't know our future, is sheer bliss. Our country is falling apart, destroyed by our people, the people I love with all my heart. The souls are diseased. The eyes are blind. Nobody understands where we're going to. In 1888, when she was traveling with her husband to the Holy Land, Elizabeth uttered these prophetic words. How I wish to be buried here. How I wish to stay here forever. Just imagine a young wife, delighted with what she experienced in the Holy Land. We can see a magnificent view, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the Golden Gate, the Kidron Stream. Beautiful and thrilling. Grand Duchess Elizabeth and her husband, were present at the consecration of this church, which was built in the memory of the mother of Grand Duke Sergei, Empress Maria Alexandrovna. Grand Duke Sergei, wrote this to his brother the Emperor, from Jerusalem. Dear Sasha, I keep thinking about you and our brothers. You would certainly find relief, if you could pray in this church, built in memory of our dear mother. Its interiors are very good, its proportions are incredibly good as well. The walls, painted in two tones, look really nice. Above the external entrance, there is a big mosaic of Saint Mary. Marvelous! Before departing, the royal travelers posed for a picture, on a lower platform of the church. Elizabeth, was just 24 years old. Probably, she did dream of coming back there again someday. But who could have thought the way her dream was going to come true? To the right of the Solia, there is Elizabeth the Martyr's Reliquary. A lot of people from all over the Orthodox world come here. A lot of people indeed. And everyone wants to stand here, close to Elizabeth, because her fame is undeniable.
I think that Saint Elizabeth belongs to the whole world, Orthodox and non-Orthodox. Romanians and Greeks come here and read Akathists. Germans come here to see their princess. Americans and Australians come here too. The whole world wants to pray at the relics of Saint Elizabeth. In Gethsemane, on the side of the Mount of Olives, lie the relics of the Grand Duchess, Saint Elizabeth the Martyr. Before she died, she repeated the words of Christ. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. God decided that Saint Elizabeth must come to him in this exact way. Through suffering, through betrayal of the Russian people she trusted. Knowing her as well as I did, I can certainly say that she was thankful to God for the suffering she was ready to take in exchange for her assassin's souls. I strongly believe that she didn't utter a single word of complaint, but thanked God for letting her suffer and thus enter the gates to the home where his chosen people live. People are not born saints, but they become. Saint Elizabeth knew love, disappointments, losses, betrayals, the splendor of palaces, and a monastic cell. But what guided her through life was prayer and love. Based strictly on primary sources, the book The Romanov Royal Martyrs offers previously unpublished texts in English from various archival sources. An impressive 512-page book featuring more than 200 black and white photographs and a 56-page full-color photo insert. Order now your copy at www.romanovs.eu.